Welcome back to Between Two Wings. I'm your host, Jay Wiles. Today, I'm really excited to be talking with Dean Neely today. He's better known as Gucci by his fellow pilots at NASA. He flies the ER-2, which is an incredible plane conducting some important scientific research. Dean, thanks for being here today. Sure. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Um, first, we'll talk about our backgrounds here. And uh, this image that I have behind me, I uh, figured out I know which flight I was at the highest altitude I've ever been in my life. And so this was taken last year. I was up at 43,000 feet. And uh, at this point, we were flying o over Oklahoma City, but that's the lights of Dallas Fort Worth up ahead. And that was just an incredible sight for me. But I can imagine this is nothing compared to what you've seen, Dean. No, that's great. Yeah, that that is. It's always great being able to look out the window and see something like that that you wouldn't normally see from uh, from down on the surface of the earth. And the uh, the background behind me, um, I took that actually just with a uh, with my iPhone uh, on a recent flight down during the uh, NASA science campaign uh, where we were looking at uh, lightning storms and things. And this was uh, during the transit uh, down towards Central America. Uh, as we were operating near the equator. And what you see here, I got a quick shot of it. This is what we call the terminator. It's the basically the termination of between day and night. And from the ground, obviously, it looks completely different when you're used to seeing a sunset or a sunrise. And then uh, after about 10 to 15 minutes, it'll engulf the entire sky. One thing to note that down beneath the clouds there, uh, it's already nighttime for everybody down on Earth. So I'm seeing daytime up here. And this is what it looks like as that transition as the Earth rotates. Um, but it's uh, what we call the Terminator. And it's always a favorite of U-2 and ER-2 high altitude pilots to to get a look at this and try to capture it. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredible. That's so incredible. Can you tell us a little bit about the ER-2, the plane you're flying? Sure. It's... Uh, it's based on the uh, the Lockheed U-2 that the military has been using since 1955 in different forms uh, for reconnaissance. At NASA, uh, we've got two of them. They're both single seaters, and we use them for high altitude airborne science. So it's a great airplane that uh, we can use to look down through the Earth's atmosphere from the top down. Um, so it's still the, the highest airplane, uh, manned airplane, air breathing in the world. So and it's very versatile. So scientists love it because uh, we're a little bit like a satellite, except we can maneuver around uh, real time. So if they're looking at things like weather effects or different systems through the atmosphere, uh, we can actually move the airplane around real time and use their science instruments to, to look down through the atmosphere at a, a target of interest. Um, I've got a, a quick model of it here. I don't know it's going to show up with my background set the way it is, but um, long cool. wing airplane. Um, it's exactly the same as the military U-2 um, as far as flight controls, the engine, everything else. So it's got long wings and a really strong uh, motor. So the jet engine is uh, a lot stronger than you would normally need for an aircraft of this type operating down in the, the normal altitudes in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so it's got the two requirements you need to fly way up high. One is those long wings. So as we get way up into the thin air where there's not enough lift uh, produced by the wings, we've got big glider type uh, wings to, to produce lift where most airplanes can't go. The other one is you've got to produce the thrust to be able to propel that aircraft through the air when it's just grasping for air molecules because they're so uh, far apart. There's... Um, uh, a jet engine typically is producing much less thrust up in the high thin air than it is down in the thicker air uh, toward the Earth's surface. So we uh, we have a very overpowered motor. So it's like a rocket down in the uh, taking off and initial climb. Uh, but then once it gets up about uh, 40 to 50,000 feet, then it starts to fly a little bit more like a normal airplane once that thrust starts to drop off. It gets great gas mileage up there. It burns less uh, fuel at full power up at 70,000 feet than it does sitting in idle at uh, sea level. Wow, which that's is incredible. Less than 200 gallons an hour, which is pretty impressive. Wow, uh, yeah. for a, a basic, you know, a turbofan engine, but it also will still produce enough thrust, even though at full power, it's only putting out about 5% of the thrust that it's rated for at sea level. It's enough to push the airplane through the air and uh, stay airborne for hours and hours. 
That's incredible. I was going to ask, what's it like to fly up at 70,000 feet? Uh, it's amazing. That's, um, so it's a, it's a, it's a great, it, you, you always have to stop and take a deep breath when you're up there in this environment and really appreciate uh, the, the privilege that it is to be there. It's a unique environment. It's in a small cockpit, which is uh, might bother some people if you have claustrophobic issues. Uh, you're in a spacesuit, um, so you can't move. Uh, you go, we're in there for nine hours or more where you, not only can you not move your arms and legs much, but you also can't scratch your nose or anything like that. <laughs> so it can drive you crazy if you, if you don't control your thoughts that well. Um, oh, but it's, um, uh, I enjoy it. In fact, I've got an old, one of the old gloves that we wear here. So we're in the full pressure suit. And so one thing that's unusual in that environment um, as soon as they integrate you into this, uh, suit on the ground, um, it slowly takes away all of your senses. So things that most pilots wouldn't have to consider, uh, things like sight, smell, touch is a big one and things like that. Uh, that's all taken away from you. So once, once you get sealed up with the helmet on and put the face plate down, uh, you have limited visibility you also can't hear anything going on around you. So there's people walking around, uh, poking at you like a lab rat, doing the leak tests on the full pressure suit and things like that. And you have no idea what they're talking about. Um, so you're the, all you can hear is yourself breathing. It's just that. Yeah. And, wow. and that's what you hear for the next, you know, nine hours or so. That's interesting. And so, and then, uh, the, the sense of feel, is one thing that's very difficult. It's a real cumbersome suit, so it's it's not comfortable at all at first. Sitting there and trying to pick up things like a pencil or anything to write with is like doing brain surgery. It's oh. just crazy, and it's something oh you have goodness. to get used to. So that ends up being a challenge because the airplane itself is really difficult to fly. It's very unstable uh, based on the uh, the design where it's point designed to fly way up in the high atmosphere. So it flies very well up there, even though we have a very small flight envelope based on speed and altitude. Uh, but it actually does uh, very well up there. It's very unstable down in the lower atmosphere in the thick air. Um, so wearing the spacesuit and trying to muscle that beast around becomes a real challenge uh, every time. Absolutely. So let's, you know, let's kind of walk through a day when you're, when you're going to go flying, what, what are the few hours before flight look like for you? You mentioned getting the suit on. What does that, uh, what kind of effort does that take? And as I understand it, you're also breathing in pure oxygen after you put that on. Yeah, that's a great question. That's another uh, unique uh, piece of the puzzle here that's uh, different from preparing for a normal flight in a regular aircraft. So typically we will uh, we will show up about three hours prior to the scheduled takeoff and start with a, uh, a weather brief and then a science briefing uh, to go over the objectives on cool. where, what, how, everything that we're going to do that day. And so we'll have all the the maintainers for the aircraft, the program managers, the uh, the scientists, uh, which are in multiple groups, depending on what kind of science instruments are strapped on the airplane uh, to use. And we have a, a big briefing there. That's typically uh, the pilot has most of the speaking parts there. Typically, we go over safety, weather conditions for takeoff and landing, as well as any hazards en route. And after that briefing that lasts about 15 minutes, uh, we finalize a lot of the paperwork and some of the normal administrative things you have to do prior to uh, flying any aircraft. Uh, and then when it's about an hour and 15 minutes uh, prior to takeoff time, that's when the the mobile pilot, which is driving the chase car, uh, who is the direct support pilot for the pilot flying the aircraft uh, for the rest of the day, he will go down and start pre-flighting the airplane. And at that same time, that's when the pilot will go start suiting up into the full pressure suit. And uh, those processes happen simultaneous, simultaneously. And what um, what the pilot's doing, we'll talk about both sides of this, because uh, it takes two ER2 pilots to, to fly one of these missions uh, each day, one in the air, one on the ground. So the pilot flying that's getting in the full pressure suit we, we want him to be suited up 
and then completely sealed into the spacesuit, breathing 100% oxygen an hour prior to takeoff. And what that does is it purges about 95% of the nitrogen out of your body, uh, which will uh, help prevent us uh, from getting the bends during the climb out or during the mission itself. It's kind of like a, uh, a scuba diver that comes from a high pressure environment up to the surface and lower pressure too quickly. And the gases in your body can expand and give you uh, the effects of what they call the bends, which is decompression sickness. And those effects can uh, manifest in different ways. Um, you can have, um, you know, different uh, skin rashes, things like that. You can get the chokes. You can uh, all the way up to brain damage. Uh, so it's something we really try to watch out for. That uh, that kind of changes the chemistry of your whole body, which also uh, has other effects like dehydration, fatigue, other things that that play into the the experience uh, for the next several hours during a longer flight, especially. And then about 45 minutes prior to the takeoff time, the pilot will be walked out and put into one of those astronaut vans uh, that you've seen on TV with the old uh, astronauts. And we get driven out to the uh, airplane and we're hooked to our oxygen uh, supply and air and everything. And then as soon as the uh, airplane is ready, uh, then they'll walk us up and they, they integrate us into the airplane. There's about 13 different connections to, to connect you to the aircraft wow. and the ignition seat and everything. So it takes two of the technicians uh, a little time to go over, make sure they do another set of leak checks and inflation uh, on the spacesuit and everything, make sure all the backup systems are ready. And then they will switch places and actually one guy reads the checklist while the other technician is checking his homework, basically. And because it's it's life and death, you can't afford to make a single mistake there. Yeah. Um, the other piece, the the pilot that's, uh, that's going to be uh, the mobile pilot, we call him, uh, while the pilot's suiting up in the spacesuit, the other pilot uh, will drive out in a chase car and take all of the equipment that the pilot needs in the cockpit uh, out, set it up in the cockpit, do the exterior and the interior inspection, uh, checking all the aircraft systems, the avionics, everything else, um, putting all the flight plan information into the computers and making sure the airplane's ready to go. Because these are things that a guy in a full pressure suit can't do. Yeah, yeah you see, absolutely. When you're on an airliner, usually the, the first officer or the co-pilot is the guy that's outside walking around the airplane. You may see him out the side window uh, if you have a window seat. And he's checking just once over to make sure everything looks good. There's nothing leaking. Uh, the tires look good. There's uh, uh, The panels are all closed, things like that. So in this case, the, uh, the other pilot, which has to be an ER2 pilot, uh, does that. And we always use another ER2 pilot, uh, just like the Air Force does with their U2s. You always have another U2 pilot that has to be driving that chase car because it's got to be somebody that's completely qualified in the airplane in every aspect of it. And on that note, um, you're probably going to wonder, why do we have that extra pilot uh, other than for the obvious part that I was just talking about? But in this environment, this is one of the few airplanes where it's a single seat airplane, so single pilot, and you don't have a co-pilot or a backseater or a wingman as far as single seat fighters go. Usually there's always going to be some kind of mutual support built in there uh, between pilots, and we don't have that in this case. And so we're way up high in the atmosphere, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles from any place that we can land. And so on the ground, the, the other pilot is assisting in the preparation for the flight also following him out in the car during taxi out and takeoff so that he can chime in on a, a discrete radio frequency if he needs to talk to the pilot and let him know that there's a problem, something unusual that he can't see. Um, and then once the airplane is up and away on the mission, now that mobile pilot is mission monitoring. So he goes back into the building and now he's monitoring how the aircraft's doing. He's the single point of communication using satellite communications uh, between the science teams and the pilot if he needs to be redirected to put the airplane somewhere else or if they need to check one of their science instruments for the health of that instrument, something didn't turn on, a heater's not working, some of the data's not recording properly, something like that. 
uh, we always have that pilot, uh, the mobile pilot, be the only guy that's allowed to uh, communicate with the pilot in the air uh, just to keep everything streamlined. Yeah. I was going to ask, too, who are you talking to when you're up there? Because, you know, Class A airspace ends at 60,000 feet as well. So are you talking to yeah, anybody that's... other than the other ER2 pilot when you're up that high? Yeah, that's a that's a great foreflight question, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so a lot of people don't know this. There's a, a few nuances up there because nobody else goes above 60,000 feet, typically, um, out of the top of the Class A airspace. So a couple of things most people don't know. Uh, above 60,000 is Class E airspace. It transitions back. Um, the altitude and distance separations are broadened out quite a bit. And the only reason you would typically have an issue from an air traffic control perspective there is if two U2s happen to be in the same airspace. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I I fly part time in the Air Force uh, in their training squadron again, like I did 25 years ago, mm -hmm. I recently went back as a civilian to do that. So I fly U twos with the Air Force as an old retired civilian again. That's awesome. Uh, which is a great experience. But yeah. sometimes when you have the the several training jets up in the air on a regular training mission on that side is when you'd mostly have two in the same airspace. Uh, you've got to have 5,000 feet separation vertically. Wow. Um, as opposed to the 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet that you would normally have in IFR conditions mm -hmm. uh, down in Class A airspace. So they want a little bigger buffer up there. Yeah. And so it's different. Another thing with uh, transponders, most of the air traffic controllers uh, have never experienced it. So sometimes when I tell them that uh, I'm climbing or I'm, I'm level at 65 or 70,000 feet, they usually ask, they say, well, your your mode C, your altitude decoder shows that you're at 60,000 feet. And then I have to explain to them that, well, all of the uh, the altitude decoders, they actually stop at 60,000 feet Oh uh, wow! by design. So it looks like any U2 up there, anything above 60,000 is going to look like it's at flight level 600. And so I have to tell them where I'm really <laughs> Uh, located. And I say, no, I'm at wow. climbing through 67,000 feet now, no problem. And uh, and then I usually have to explain it just like I did to you because mm -hmm. they've never seen it before. Wow, but that's so interesting. Those are some of the, the nuances from an air traffic control or a flight planning uh, issue that, that we deal with up there. Yeah, absolutely. I had such a great time talking with Dean that we couldn't fit everything into just one episode. So coming up in the next episode of Between Two Wings, Dean will talk about how he combats dehydration flying at such a high altitude, and he also gives us some insight into several of the challenges the ER2 pilots face in flight, like how do they eat, operate scientific equipment on board, and use ForeFlight on their iPads while wearing a modified spacesuit. That and much more on the next episode of Between Two Wings. Between Two Wings